Good morning. Well, <laughs> hey, good morning and uh, uh, welcome to Building Values on the Politicization of uh, Media Platforms. Third day of the conference today. And this year, uh, as you have well heard already, we take fi uh, face value as a starting point in order to address uh, the simultaneous crisis of uh, politics, values, and meanings in today's economized world. And we use its definitions and connotations to address in parallel issues connected to finance, to identity, and to language, and to underline in a way how they interconnect when it comes to discussing today's phenomena of xenophobia, hatred, and violence. In this morning session, a format with special guests and part participants from different parts of our program, uh, that we use to, in a way, ask which values and whose values are we really talking about. Uh, we will aim to directly tackle the role of media platforms and their so-called politicization. What stance, uh, we want to ask, do media take, or we expect them to take, when it comes not only to hate speech, but also to the numerous categorizations and filterings that they involve? And how might embedded biases connect to, connect to embedded values? The session will be introduced and moderated by Marta Beirano. Marta is a writer, journalist, and journalist who has been engaging with issues concerning individual privacy, government transparency, digital security, and free culture. She's the writer of the book Pequeño Libro Rojo de la Activista en Red, and she's currently the deputy director of the Spanish national daily, El Diario. Please welcome Marta and our speakers. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Transmariale, for inviting me, and thank you, all of you, for being here. Uh, my name is Marta Peirano. I've been a journalist for 20 years. I'm going to talk about me a little bit now. <laughs> um, I, uh, I started writing about technology in 1997. That's, that's how lucky I am. And um, it's been a wild ride. And, um, and in the last few years, I have, I have uh, written for, um, I have gone through um, from printed press. I've written for the two main printed newspapers in Spain to, um, to become the founder of, of uh, two um, uh, national daily digital newspapers. Uh, one with shitloads of money before 2007 and one with fuck all money uh, five years ago. <laughs> this is a story that you will hear a lot uh, from media people. Um, it's been like interesting going from printed media to online media because even though it has the same task, it is a very, very different job. And, um, and technically, it's never been better because um, uh, we have the uh, sudden ability to reach our audience, whatever it is, and to reach uh, this audience uh, instantly, <laughs> constantly. And, uh, and for pretty much no money. So um, we also have the ability to receive, like, you know, uh, documents from anyone in the world uh, uh, through private channels. This, this is an amazing ability that turns pretty much anyone into a potential source. And, um, and uh, yeah, uh, we have technology that, that can help us to through data to turn it into in information, uh, which is also uh, a really interesting ability, superpower, I would say. And yet, uh, we have managed to, to run into a crisis. And, uh, and we've been in crisis as an institution for uh, as long as I have been a journalist. Though um, the first serious crisis that I, that I experienced was when uh, the blogosphere was gonna kill journalism. That was 15 years ago. And um, and now we have this ongoing um, this ongoing uh, rumor that uh, social media is killing journalism. And uh, and uh, I have the uh, like I, I I can't shake the feeling that we're doing the same pretty much the same thing that uh, that Hillary Clinton is doing with with Putin. You know, like how she's blaming Putin for losing the elections, uh, like she was not <laughs> the worst possible candidate uh, for the Democratic Party, or she didn't actually trump her way into that position. I have the feeling that, that uh, newspapers, uh, especially online newspapers, are, are blaming social media and fake news and, uh, and filter bubbles and, and, um, and, uh, and <laughs> Russian trolls for uh, pretty much everything we've been doing wrong for the last 15 years. And, 
I have this uh, interesting uh, data from the Edelman barometers um, that, uh, that was published a few days ago. It says that 63% of readers uh, do not know how to tell good journalism from rumor or falsehood. 59% cannot tell if a piece of news was produced by a respected media organization uh, or someone else. And 70% uh, is concerned about fake news and false information being used as a weapon uh, or as a tool to influence or disrupt national elections. So uh, in the last year, we've been, we the media have been facing questions of hate speech, the impact of algorithm mediation over content generation and distribution, filter bubbles and the role of social media platforms on the generally apocalyptic state of affairs. Uh, but uh, in the best of times, as the uh, one newspaper person in the in the room, or at least in the table, I would uh, say that we've been failing to do our job properly. And that uh, we, I mean, I used to say we worked for Google because we were so desperate to be first uh, that we pretty much swapped every uh, veteran in our newspapers for uh, three interns uh, because they knew how to get first. And um, also we've been, um, We've been setting up content management systems that automatically publish uh, everything that comes from agencies without the editor um, running through uh, the material that we publish so we could be first. Um, urgent, the word urgent in media used to mean, uh, I don't know, like a coup d'etat, a national disaster, uh, um, you know, a terrorist attack, uh, or I don't know, a crisis of fundamental uh, critical infrastructures. And yet now the word urgent just means, look at me, I got there first. And, uh, and uh, the word uh, exclusive used to mean we put our best people uh, for as long as they need it uh, to investigate this particular topic because we think it's important for you to know what's going on around here. And now it means, look at me, I got that first. And sometimes, like, you know, I come from Spain and I work for Spanish media and getting there first doesn't even mean getting there first. It just means that you translated it first from the internet, uh, which is quite, quite a problem. So, um, also, um, we've been publishing articles that weren't finished just to push uh, the headlines uh, before anyone else did because we were working for Google. And now in the last few years, we've been basically trying to please the algorithms uh, that are run by, uh, by social media platforms because that has become our mediator uh, uh, for pretty much everything we publish. And, um, and this has an impact on the way we, uh, we um, produce our news. Not only we're uh, changing urgency for, uh, for you know, relevancy, but also in this political context, uh, we've been actually pushing for um, for the soap opera part of politics uh, because, you know, it is way more fun to read uh, House of Cards than to read The State of the Nation. And, um, and, uh, and so we run into a crisis and now we're blaming uh, social media for it. We have in this, uh, in this panel um, very, very interesting uh, artists, investigators and, uh, and civil rights um, uh, you know, uh, people that will give us uh, different takes on this uh, problem of algorithms and fake news. This is the journalist uh, one that I'm giving you. Um, so, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> I didn't print my papers right. So there, um, uh, here to discuss the politicization of media platforms and what they are doing uh, to news and society in general. We have Vali Djordjevic, <laughs> editor of iRights.info, uh, champion of digital rights for the internet age. Um, uh, we have Vlad Anjoler, uh, director of the very, very amazing SHARE Foundation and, uh, and uh, boss of the SHARE Lab and professor of the new media uh, department at the University of Novi Sad. Um, Rowe Rosen, um, uh, what? <laughs> Uh, filmmaker and professor at uh, Hamid Rasa Art College and the Betzalen Art Academy in Israel. Uh, we have Jillian Dork, Director of International Freedom of Expression at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. 
and Mark Tutor is Professor of New Media and Digital Culture at University of Amsterdam and Director of the Opens Open Intelligence Lab. So um, uh, each one of them is going to give you a quick introduction to their work and research. And so I'm going to uh, pass the mic to Alec. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for having me here and I'm looking very much forward to the discussion. Um, I just wanted to open up with a few yeah, general observations that um, I have made. Um, I'm working as a journalist um, on the one hand, um, mainly about consumer information, so we are informing mainly consumers about their rights, but also about security issues. Um, at the moment I'm working with Mobile Sicher, which is about mobile security. Um, but on the other hand, I'm also involved for 20 years now with, with cyber feminism or feminist issues, feminist media art. Um, so um, these are kind of like the, the two perspectives I'm kind of taking. Um, so I hope my remarks are kind of one starting point for a discussion between us, but also later for the audience. Um, yeah. So social media platforms, so and, and mainly I'm going to talk about hate speech and the moderation of hate speech by social media. So it's maybe a bit of a different focus than the, this whole journalism focus, but I think fake news, hate speech, they are kind of connected because they kind of work hand in hand um, for a specific yeah, goal. Um, so social media platforms seem to be the new town squares of our times. Um, that's where we meet, we brag our achievements, we show our solidarity and our holiday photos. But in reality, of course, they're not town squares, but more like shopping malls. Um, so it's not my own idea, it's a pretty obvious metaphor, I guess. Um, and I read it somewhere, I don't know where. <laughs> so it means um, if someone misbehaves on Facebook, on Twitter, or wherever, it's not um, by by police that is at least somewhat democratically controlled by laws, but um, there is private security that kind of um, drags you away um, and removes this person according uh, to rules that are mostly secret and very arcane. Um, of course, we have some kind of idea what these rules are, or some people try, like, like Vladan, for example, to try to make sense of these ideas. Um, and I also read another um, analysis by ProPublica, which is a kind of non-profit investigative journal, uh, online journal. They got hold of some um, internal documents by Facebook. Um, how Facebook, how this moderation team, which I, I think at the moment 9,000 people worldwide are doing this, um, and probably getting more because uh, there is a lot of pressure on Facebook to, to moderate it. Um, that like the, the um, yeah, what are the, these, uh, so in these internal documents they are written down the internal rules how Facebook moderates hate speech uh, and decides what is, what is hate speech and what is a legitimate uh, political expression. Um, and one of the results was, for example, and I found that pretty shocking, that being a white man makes you a protected category in Facebook. Um, in Facebook's eyes while being a black child or woman driver, for example, does not. So people are not allowed to write something against white men in general, but you could be really awful to women drivers. This, this should be okay. So the reasoning behind that is that um, it's not allowed to target groups in general, like broad groups, but um, you are allowed to target specific subgroups. So it means practically, that you are allowed to say about um, radicalized Muslims, hunt them, identify them, and kill them, kill them all, for the sake of all that is good and righteous, kill them all. That is a quote. Um, but you are not allowed to say all white people are racist. Start from this reference point or you've already failed. So the first thing uh, appeals like is really kind of uh, uh, an appeal to killing, and the other thing is just like about rethinking white privilege. So the first thing for Facebook is okay, the second one is not, which um, I think is a total problem. The second one, the, the uh, all white people are racist, was said by the Black Lives Matter activist Didi Delgado, and she got suspended for this post from Facebook seven days, and the post was um, also deleted. So there seems to be an internal bias against um, the speech against 
the, so there is kind of a proliferation of, of hate speech towards minorities, black people, Muslims, women, Jewish people, whatever, I mean. Um, and this, of course, limits our uh, political discourse if you can't say it. As a woman, for example, um, during Gamergate, you had to t think twice if you would like include yourself in this discussion about Gamergate, because you kind of knew that if you started to take a position, um, that a horde of masculinists will, will descend on you and like dox you or whatever. Um, so it is an internal censoring of yourself. This is of course not only a problem on Facebook, that women um, and minorities are targeted more than white men. Um, the Guardian published a study last year, I think, where they, um, on, their, on their comment section, uh, which comments, um, which articles text got most hate speech. And um, surprisingly enough, or not surprisingly, um, the top 10 of articles that got most uh, really negative comments were uh, the top 10 consisted of nine women. One was a guy, but this guy was black, so. Um, so it looks that the definition of what constitutes hate speech is biased against women, non-white people, and poor people. So it privileges um, the people who already have power. Um, and of course, this is kind of a business decision for Facebook because um, it's bad for business if they make really controversial decisions. Um, so also um, because it's not published how they decided and we can only guess from ProPublica, from Share, whatever, um, there is no real debate possible. I mean, Facebook also doesn't really um, give reasons why your post was deleted. I mean, you get mostly like just a generic thing and then you can complain and then they said, okay, well, it still um, is against our community rules. You complain again and maybe you get a real human sometimes. I mean, so, so it's really, really a very opaque um, system. Um, and I think it's, it would be really important to open this up so we could have a real debate. Um, okay, um, and the last thing I want um, to add uh, or to say is um, that um, another problem we have is that um, the, our governments increasingly rely on, the, on this policing by Facebook. In Germany, for example, we have since the 1st of January a new law that's called Netzwerkdurchsetzungsgesetz, which um, kind of um, is meant to force Facebook, Twitter, and other social media to be more proactive against hate speech because they took so long to kind of um, uh, delete like real hate speech. Uh, and now they have uh, 24 hours and there are a lot of penalties against it. But what this la law basically does is codify this private security um, activity that I already outlined into law. And this is a real problem because, um, because like I said, there is no transparency. We don't know why they are doing this. Um, and um, having governments like relying on, on Facebook um, or like Twitter or Google, whoever, um, with Google we have this um, law to be, for, uh, this, this right to be forgotten that is also kind of um, made where, where the governments kind of made Google um, work on, on what, what, what to do and what, what kind of information to um, not, not to show an, anymore. Um, so this is kind of a problem. So um, I think um, in the end we have like really to think about this um, yeah, relationship between uh, platforms and platform politics, government, society, and how there can be a new balance. At the moment, I don't see a real balance, but um, like more and more like outsourcing to private companies. Maybe that's for a start. So, so I guess the, uh, the problem of like trying to regulate, um, you know, um, transnational um, companies uh, with local, local uh, regulation is pretty much impossible. So outsourcing uh, that kind of problem to their algorithms, which is what we do, no? Every time we don't know how to resolve something, we just leave it to, to those algorithms is, a, is an issue. And, uh, and the main problem there is that they are totally opaque. Uh, and uh, Vladim can tell us how difficult, uh, impossibly difficult it is to try, to try to put some light over them. So we, 
Mm. I, I just throw this uh, complex back s mm, black picture on the projection just as an illustration of like maybe what I'm going to speak in like a few minutes, but but there is like a wider picture. So how we get there is that we were like working with uh, mostly investigative journalists, uh, journalists and uh, online media in Serbia, and uh, uh, trying really working there as some kind of like, as I said on the last lecture, some kind of like ambulance trying to fix like different kinds of attacks and and, and trying to be some some kind of support in cases of, of uh, cyber attacks and then. And then we were like step by step uh, opening different fields of, of this, what we can call information uh, warfare. And, and then we realized in one moment, all of those efforts, as you said, are at the end coming to the point that there is someone else, like someone in, in, in California or some machines, invisible machines, basically deciding what we are going to see. So all of those efforts of those investigative journalists and so on, so on, like a lot of, lot of drama on the field, you know, to, to get what is truth. No? And then at the end, everything is finishing in some kind of screen on, on Facebook and, and likes, and then all of those like investigative journalists and, 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 and people that we were working with were like, you know, like we are working, I don't know, six months in, in investigating corruption and doing something, but at the end, you know, it have just 100 likes and I don't know how many shares, but in the same moment, I don't know which folk star have three billion shares and whatever, whatever. So there is a, uh, if, if, if we can say that this, what we are seeing through online media to, to social, through social networks is some kind of reality show, you know, and uh, <coughs> what director of reality show, it's, it's basically an algorithm and uh, in combination with humans. So. And those kind of like, so we have like uh, in the same moment, like two billion reality shows that are directed by some piece of code machine in combination with humans, but we really, our capacity to understand what's going on there, it's so limited because for example, Facebook kid even, I think, don't have some kind of PR uh, part of organization who you can talk with. So what we did, we tried to, to investigate those like black boxes on different ways. So, but it's really hard. So what, what we are seeing here, uh, it's kind of map that um, describes how, uh, describe how our behavior is transformed into profit. But basically it's the same map, half of the map also can uh, dis describe how, uh, how the newsfeed algorithm works. Because like on the left side of the map you have like data collection, in the middle you have uh, storage of the data and then on the right side you have like transformation of this data into profit. Uh, but in order to impressive uh, perhaps even parodic reworking of the way power works in real life, like, you know, often um, dramatizing situations from re real life, like teacher and pupil, policeman and prisoner, etc. Uh, I feel the reversal that I experience now is very much similar to what happened when the Abu Ghraib uh, images came out in 2004. That is, suddenly reality seems to mimic sadomasochistic pornography and you get totally confused as to what would be the right thing to do. And I think that in the present situation, what I wanted to point at was the risk of uh, left-wing uh, politics assuming a kind of a positivist, essentialist notions of identity. And for that, I wanted to speak about the reception of two, recent reception of two quite uh, well-established artists. One is uh, Omer Fast, uh, is an artist based in here in Berlin. And his last show was in Chinatown at the James Cohen Gallery in, uh, in New York. Uh, and it was heavily attacked by the local community. And again, I'm picking on two marginalized community who have a right uh, claim to, to, to feel that they're op opposed by the powers that be, right? They're, they're not the white men who will not be censored. Uh, and uh, what Omar Fass did, uh, inside the space was an, a screening of a 3D movie about August Zander. But outside and in the foyer, which I'll show you in a second, uh, he kind of fabricated what appeared to be like a Chinese store. 
and was immediately attacked for being, you know, uh, using a kind of, a, you know, orientalist uh, fantasy on Chinatown, which is totally inauthentic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's another. Uh, and the other case I wanted to speak of uh, also very recently and very uh, visible within the art scene, I don't know how many people here belong to that, uh, to that fold, is the case of Jimmy Durham, who's a major, major American artist who was known to be and dealt with his Native American identity, but already in the late 80s was uh, attacked for not being a real Indian, okay? So the Native American community itself uh, wanting to be sovereign and self-determining, he was never a member really of uh, this community formally, perhaps because of his refusal or disavowal of, uh, you know, bracketing his own identity in a determined way. Uh, and uh, as his retrospective was shown in different cities in the States recently, was attacked for not being a real Indian, a real Native American. Reality here, going down to the level of DNA, right? Uh, not being a Native American, meaning that you faked your identity or claim to be something that you're not, but the tools to determine what's real or not are very similar to the tools of eugenics, of uh, biogenetics, of uh, Nazi ideology, etc. So that's the danger that I want to point at and to also point that in both cases, what happened was much more complex. Uh, I contacted Omar Fass because the case uh, really fascinated me, and it turned out that uh, not only was he not fantasizing orientalistically, but actually did a simulation of an actual place that uh, was two blocks away. So what he did really was simulation rather than fantasizing. He subjugated it himself to a, an actual space that exists in, in Chinatown, and you can see images of the recreation and the real space side by side in a way putting the viewer in a kind of an active position of judgment. That is, we are not supposed to accept, to take for granted that something is real or unreal, but rather to use art as a kind of a problematic liminal zone where you are demanded to be active in judging what, what, what it is that you see. All right, uh, a few more slides. And I'm just showing you a couple of images of uh, Jimmy Durham, in which case I think identity is critically parodic, I would say. Uh, this is an early portrait from the late, late 80s, I'm sorry. And you can see that notions of what a minority identity might be are presented in a rather complex and uh, multi-layered uh, way, as are objects and the relation of people to objects. This is part of uh, a museum of stones that was actually shown here in House of Culture under Welt. Uh, in this case, uh, showing ossified uh, foodstuff, uh, bacon, for example. And uh, I was thinking of speaking also about something that I did, but maybe it's, I should maybe stop here. Okay. okay. So this, this Dungham story reminds me, of well, I was living in Atlanta uh, when uh, Barack Obama became a candidate uh, for elections in the States. And I, rem and I was watching Fox News all the time because it was so much fun. And... Um, and I remember at first they were like, but I mean, this is ridiculous, like he's black. <laughs> and then immediately, like one week later, it was like, but he's not a real black because his parents were not like, you know, slaves or something like this. And then this evolved into what I think was the beginning of this like fake news era uh, that somehow started with like Macedonian kids pumping like uh, endless amount of ridiculous stuff into the internet, which was the birth or the birthers, no? Like this idea that Barack Obama was <laughs> not even American and that he needed to show his, uh, his birth certificate, etc. cetera. So, uh, Mark, um, two days ago in this very room, you were running um, a very interesting workshop um, considering some of these uh, problems and, uh, and I think coming to uh, some surprising conclusions. So, please. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, so I will, um, I'll try to kind of recapitulate what we tried to do in this room a couple days ago. Uh, so the topic of the workshop was meme war lab. Uh, these are some political memes, and uh, I would like to interpret the concept of built-in value in terms of what we would call um, the affordances of the platform. And uh, in particular, I would like to sort of propose that we could think of memes, political memes, which often uh, 
border on hate speech as uh, um, in relation to the, in this particular affordance of the platform of 4chan that we were looking at, 4chan, Paul, the politically incorrect board of 4chan. So um, these are all just memes of Donald Trump, but perhaps in order to make the point, I might just go live onto the internet, and if you will tolerate it, I'll just go on to 4chan. Oh, uh, it's perhaps easier to do it through Google. And I would like to uh, just, the point of this is, is to show you the temporality of 4chan. And uh, if something pornographic or gory comes up, please be warned. So every time I refresh this, you'll notice in all likelihood that the page, that the, uh, no, there's so something going on at the moment, uh, that most of the um, posts will have changed. There's a lot of discussion around this particular topic. Generally speaking, from one moment to the next, it doesn't look the same. So this, with the exception of this one, <coughs> oh fuck, what now? So um, <coughs> the point of that I want to make by showing you that is that there's this uh, very particular temporality to this platform. And uh, so there, th you could think of memes as uh, a way to be able to um, respond to that affordance. Uh, the other thing that's characteristic about this platform is, as you can see, the posts are anonymous. So there's these two aspects to this platform. One, that it is very ephemeral, uh, and that is, that is what contributes to this, um, to this uh, temporality, and two, that it is anonymous. And so in order for people to be able to express their, uh, in, or in order for people to stay in the conversation, they need to uh, create memes and uh, those memes uh, then allow them to identify themselves as not being outsiders. So I will now show you a few memes that we categorized from that platform. This is a meme called a Merry Mutt. And it is uh, one of the newer memes that uh, has emerged recently. And it's used to kind of um, make fun of American plebeian identity. And it's also used as a kind of a racist uh, uh, attack on America. So actually, Europeans use this to critique America. You can tell that one thing that you can see when people post to Fortune Paul is uh, their, th their there's a country flag for their IP address. So what we did notice is that this is one of the memes that is used internationally. <coughs> Australian guy. This is feels guy. This is, these are memes that are uh, anti-Semitic in nature. And you'll notice that uh, uh, this particular meme which is known as Ju Bwahaha or uh, Le Happy Merchant, is uh, one of the more popular memes, perhaps the third most popular meme on 4chan Paul. Um, the number of memes in these uh, uh, image boards uh, are a representation of the total number that we found um, in our data set, which we coded uh, manually. And I'm going to, for the sake of uh, brevity, I'm just going to now demonstrate the success of this particular meme by doing a Google search. So I typed the word Jew into Google search and it is the second top image in Google search that came up, uh, a 4chan meme. And so I would sort of propose this uh, in relation to the concept of uh, algorithmic bias as perhaps a something to consider. Uh, I brought this up with uh, the represent representative of the European representative of Google. I asked them, why is this particular image here? And they said that it's very difficult to uh, address uh, images from a computational perspective. But I think that uh, th there is there are also a lot of advances that are being made in, um, 
working in uh, machine in machine learning, uh, and so I would propose this as perhaps a case, a normative case in favor of uh, algorithmic bias to identify this particular image, at least as a provocation, in relation to the topic of this panel. Well, thank you, Matt. So, um, what you're proposing is that we censor that particular meme. <laughs> I'm offering it as a provocation, yeah. <laughs> okay. So I guess after this round, we can, we can agree that uh, the, the main topic at hand here is the question of censorship, right? If, uh, if um, some values uh, are to be gained or are to be lost, uh, if we use our or someone's algorithmic powers uh, in order to control what's published or what's not. And... Um, I mean, I think the only, the only previous experience that we have in this regard uh, would be the kind of algorithms that are used in things like YouTube to control the, um, the publication of, uh, of uh, copyrighted material uh, by, um, by users, um, platforms that are using uh, content uh, that is uploaded by uh, random people. Uh, I think they are the first and the only, uh, no, they are not. Okay, <laughs> you have the mic. I mean, my point here being that obviously um, the kind of um, algorithmic solution that uh, that Google has uh, has uh, implemented for uh, not infringing uh, copyright in YouTube uh, benefits uh, those that are whitelisted by uh, Google and YouTube, which is obviously uh, the main. Um, um, the main uh, music and uh, film producers in America. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, your ability to produce uh, new content that is not whitelisted and, uh, and still being on YouTube has become very hard. Uh, classic example now was a few w weeks ago. Um, this Australian person uploaded 10 hours of white noise in YouTube and uh, before he even published it, he got five uh, copyright infractions uh, um, through the uh, through the algorithm, the algorithm told him that he had broken five <laughs> copyright um, copyright laws uh, just by uploading white noise, uh, random white. Apparently, randomness is heavily <laughs> copyrighted. Um, so, um, so what's the other experience that we have on this topic? So, the other example is that we've already exceptionalized terrorism. Um, so terrorism, um, not as defined by the UN, not as defined by the US government, well, kind of as defined by the US government, but primarily as defined by private companies, private actors behind closed doors, um, has already been tr um, given this algorithmic treatment. So on Twitter, um, where they've taken down almost a million accounts over the past few years using spam tools, using literally using spam fighting technology, and that's what they've said in their own words, um, YouTube does this uh, with relation to content specifically coming from ISIS or Daesh or whatever you want to call them. Um, they're using algorithms to detect and take down that content. It's the only case where they've said explicitly that they're using algorithms to automatically take down content rather than just to flag it for human content moderators. And so I think one, I, I'm, I think I'm not going to respond per se on censorship yet. I feel like that's a conversation that can keep happening. But I think it's interesting that these U.S.-based companies have already treated terrorism as an exceptional case. And I would suggest that perhaps this is at the suggestion of the U.S. government. So um, a few days ago, I was I was in another panel where um, it was being argued that. Uh, that Google ha has been um, actually pretty good at, at filtering things like uh, child pornography, uh, uh, which is images, <laughs> and, um, and yeah, like um, some kinds of terrorism, I guess the ones that are not whitelisted. <laughs> and uh, I guess when you're talking about like this terrorist lists, uh, you're talking about lists that include like maybe Greenpeace, uh, that maybe, no, like, you know, even animal rights activisms and all that. So it's not the traditional list that you're talking about? Um, no, no, I am talking about the, basically what the companies do without saying this explicitly, but I can say with, I can say that I've heard this um, from, you know, birds in my ears. Um, I can say that, yeah, most of what these companies are doing is using the U.S. government, the U.S. State Department's list of designated terrorist organizations, which it does not include Greenpeace, of course, right, well, at least not yet. Um, <laughs> right now, though, it also doesn't include any white supremacist groups, any street gangs in the U.S. It's primarily, the list is Islamic terrorist groups and a couple of communist groups. 
um, it's public, it's a public list. I think it's 21 organizations at the moment. I, I believe so, I haven't looked at it recently, but it's it's all of the typical ones, you know, ISIS, Hamas, Hezbollah, but then it's also um, um, so a couple of Latin American groups, a couple of right-wing groups in other countries, an Iranian organization. Um, I don't have it memorized, but it's, it's a public list. Uh, but the companies don't explicitly say that that's what they're basing it on. So, um, Vladim, you've been um, researching these algorithms for quite a while. What do you think is a, like a proper, like, you know, uh, solution uh, could be to maintain the, um, you know, uh, the maximum amount of, of, um, of freedom uh, at the platforms uh, uh, without having to expose, I don't know, <laughs> whatever, uh, society to uh, fake news and, and, uh, and the like? I mean, maybe the question is, is it, is it technically possible to resolve that problem? I, I think it's more like uh, the matter of truth it's more like philosophical than a technical question. I, that's like how I feel. So I don't believe that it's possible. I think, think it's even dangerous to, to think about idea that, that we can define what is truth, what is false through any algorithm. Because like existence of such an algorithm will create new forms of discrimination, you know, because like, so, and, and I think for us as a society, it's really important to leave the question of truth to be open like for discussion not to have like a technically defined truth so and and, and I, I was like really shocked with this idea when because in in, in, uh, in Serbia in Yugoslavia probably in East East Europe maybe in general we are like more used to fake news like we I kind of like grow up with with this, uh, uh, with the idea that what you are seeing, it's like projection of someone political or any idea. So like we, when I'm, when I'm, I grow up with the idea when I'm reading something, I'm trying to read what is behind that. You know, like I'm not receiving this as a information. And then for us, it was like, so I, I, f I felt like, like funny in a way, like how people get disturbed now like with this idea of fake news like it's like okay what's new but <laughs> and and uh, and uh, and I, I spoke a lot about this topic with uh, like different investigative journalists in in, in Serbia and, and stuff and, and and basically they say like you know it, it coming from idea this belief and why everyone is like uh, you know disturbed because like there is belief in in, in, in that what you are reading it's true <laughs> in like this is some kind of like tradition of like uh, Western idea of like media that it's a big truth, you know? And we like completely uh, think different. But as I said, like it's really, really, and especially it's really crazy idea to, to, to put this responsibility on the company. Like now we say like this company is going to say what is true and what is not. And please do it for us, like please. Why are you not doing this better? You know, like why you don't? You I really don't understand that. I, 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 I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I have a fake news on my plate. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I remember like you know there was a time where the motto of the New York Times was like all the all the news that's fit to print, <laughs> which is an interesting motto when you think about it. No, like you know who says? Uh, and they are doing this job now. They are deciding. Um, yeah. Uh, this is what I was meaning to say uh, at the introduction, that um, if we, the media, are uh, producing news that are indistinguishable from fake news, we're probably doing a very poor job. Um, so um, I welcome uh, fake news um, as, a, as a call of, uh, as a call of uh, urgency to, <laughs> to recover maybe some, some um, I don't know, some responsibility, because of course uh, media outlets are, are necessarily private companies that have to necessarily act as, uh, as public services. So we are in a very, very particular position where we have to make money and to fend for ourselves because <laughs> we cannot get money from the government, of course. Um, but at the same time, we need to be a public service and, uh, and our you know, self-maintenance cannot be our priority. So um, um, this is the um, particular uh, structure that has become so uh, interestingly um, difficult for new outlets that, you know, now that 
creating a news outlet uh, has become a very cheap, uh, a very cheap um, enterprise. So um, yeah, um, I guess. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, like, there is like in the last year or so, like, there is some kind of this madness about fake news story, no? And uh, and, uh, and there is a lot of money as well in in like. Uh, you know, European Union, everyone is like now throwing money on people who want to research fake news, you know, like because now we are under attack, truth is under attack and stuff like this. But th th what is like for me really interesting is that we are kind of like ready to, so we spoke for years about like um, freedom of expression. It was like really popular, you know, and uh, lots of great ideas. And now we are just completely forgotten in all of this discussions from like one, two, three, five years ago, because now there is a new enemy, you know, like, and now we are ready to, to censor, we are ready to, like, it's completely normal to, I don't know, censor like Russian whatever, you know, Twitter account, or like, like, why, you know, like, it, it's, it's a really strange, like, change of, of, of discourse, and I, I also, like, want to, it's it's a critic of also like this kind of activist and and uh, an NGO scene in a way that is able now to switch to this topic and 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 completely like forget about like some values that we were like taking before as an important. No? So uh, at um, your I rights uh, organization, you are creating tools uh, that are not censoring tools for this uh, kind of problems. Uh, no, what would they be? No, not really. No, we are really doing different stuff, so it's mainly information things. Um, can I have the same time? Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, no, um, so our, yeah, we are d doing different things, so it's mo really just information for, for people how to like deal with, with all kinds of um, stuff or all kinds of technical issues or legal issues on the internet. So we are not working in this area actually. Sorry. I, I can speak to that point, I think. Um, so I, I agree with this um, skepticism and, and, and unease around the issue of censorship. Um, and I would suggest, for example, with the provocation that I made before, that it's more of a call to, for monitoring. And I think that monitoring is a much more uh, effective way to address this issue, to keep track of the demand for fake news uh, so as to be able to address it, uh, not necessarily through censorship, but uh, to, uh, to, to identify its uh, presence. Because I'll give you one example. The, uh, perhaps people know the very famous fake news story that uh, I, I suppose it was claimed that it was created in uh, some town in Macedonia uh, that uh, the Pope endorsed Donald Trump. It was the most successful, most engaged with fake news story. And uh, it was <coughs> actually originally made as a satirical news piece and then it uh, exploded into popularity at a particular moment in time. And, uh, it ex and there uh, have been comments on the relationship of journalists to this phenomenon by debunking it, that it ha actually helps, helps to circulate the story. And so then there's this question of how does one respond to that. Um, there's an interesting framing, for example, that you could think of it as a is what, what, what is the appropriate degree of response? At what point has it been debunked enough? And what at what point does the kind of immune response of debunking turn into like an autoimmune reaction of just spreading out of control? In any case, the point that I want to make about that is that uh, the day that that news story went viral was the d same day that uh, Donald Trump, the, the tape, uh, grab them by the pussy tape came out. It was also the same day that the WikiLeaks uh, Podesta emails came out. So all of that was what in the US they would call the October surprise. And um, the reason arguably why people engaged with that news story is because they wanted that news story. They, they were asking themselves how could they vote for Donald Trump when he had said that. And so this thing met a market demand. And so th that's, that is, I think, the fundamental issue in relation to this sort of 
post-truth environment is how fantasy can kind of enter into um, political discourse and become a, a kind of um, a political factor. There is also a super interesting thing with the with um, um, with that particular um, kind of <laughs> fake news uh, and the and the way uh, Facebook as a platform manages its hyper segmented uh, population uh, in the sense that um, the way it works is that um, you can you can produce uh, this kind of news and you can serve it to a very very specific uh, part of your users. Um, white supremacists that live in a specific area uh, at a particular time uh, during the day. Um, and so um, the thing that I find the most problematic about this and that uh, I think it hasn't been talked about enough is the fact that the rest of the users don't see it. So um, when I'm in the States and I'm, and I'm seeing all these uh, birthers, uh, you know, being born, <laughs> I can look at Fox News and I know where they come from. Uh, but if I don't have that, that little crumbs path uh, to, you know, whatever, um, uh, whatever source is producing this kind of information, I just think they are crazy. <laughs> like there's something in the water. And this for me is a fundamental, uh, a structural problem that is not a technical problem, it's a problem that has been produced on purpose. And uh, the fact that um, we are talking about filter bubbles when uh, as something that we pick ourselves to do, no? like we pick the news that we want to read, we pick the, the, you know, the hysteric uh, um, you know, stories about our political um, uh, antagonists uh, that we would like to happen. Um, we're blaming ourselves for something that is actually embedded in the structure of the very uh, sources that we are dealing with. So, um, yeah, uh, I guess instead of talking about how uh, Facebook should be policing its own algorithms, we should be talking more about how that kind of thing should be totally uh, banned from existence. It, that, that would be a technical problem. <laughs> but, um, sorry. Um, I just wanted to add something that I think it wasn't really mentioned. Um, I think one of the problems is that Facebook doesn't consider itself as, m as a media outlet, mm -hmm. um, but they consider themselves as a platform. Mm -hmm. They have, of course, enormous power um, in what we see or don't see, like you said, um, but they really don't want to decide stuff on their own because then there would be a media outlet and they would have responsibility and they would I don't know, I have to conform to kind of a codex of the press or whatever. Um, and um, I just, re uh, like two weeks ago, I think Mark, Mark Zuckerberg kind of uh, talked about this new Facebook algorithm uh, that they kind of want to change what we see in the Facebook algorithm. And um, one of the results of what, what, what is supposed to happen or is already happening in the US and I think it will be played out in, in on the other kind of platforms is that um, Facebook wants to show less news stories and more kind of user content um, and the user the, the news stories that they want to show um, have to be kind of reliable uh, but they don't, of course, they don't want to decide themselves what is kind of reliable news, but they have a community system, so people can flag what are good news and can flag what are b bad news. So you have this crowdsourcing again. But of course, I mean, it's kind of obvious when you think about it, that of course it's not a problem kind of to flag uh, whatever right-wing um, white supremacist sites as, as reliable news. If enough people flag them, they, that will kind of be again uh, shown. So, um, and I think this, this thing about um, platforms and the power Facebook, Google, and these other platforms have, um, that they don't want to be so obvious because that would be bad for business. I, I said that I think in the, in, in the that is something we, we kind of have to discuss. Um, so this thing, are they media outlets? And they are kind of media and they are like, you know, showing us a lot, like a lot of uh, people uh, what, what they want to see. So that is kind of, I think, I think a problem. Indeed. And what, how they feel about it is, is I think, uh, uh, pretty well portrayed in the fact that they've been courting China uh, for the last two years nonstop. <laughs> so I guess, 
Yeah, this reminds me also of the time of collective intelligence. Uh, God, I miss those times. <laughs> so um, should we open uh, the table to questions from the audience? I think there is a mic uh, that should be moving around. Yes. So um, does anyone in the audience have a question? Hello, thank you for this uh, wonderful discussion. Um, I have a question about the politicization of platforms, not just media platforms, but other forms of platforms, uh, through the a specific example of how uh, today anti-CC activists in Egypt are sending each other pro-CC images and memes and keeping them on their phone. So if the police or the mukhabarat stop them and go through, they see that, oh, you're pro-CC, so move along. And uh, if they get an anti-CC thing, you know, they laugh and then they delete it immediately. Uh, sort of closer to Vladin's point about, um, you know, knowing when it's fake and not knowing when it's fake in the general argument about censorship. Um, I think for a civilized society to expect stupidity from your um, citizens is actually losing the greater war, as it were, in the struggle. And I just wanted people's thoughts about that. I like that's a kind of a stenography, no? <laughs> like you're hiding your true intentions uh, under a layer of uh, the opposite ones. But you, well, you, you're, uh, you work with, with uh, issues of uh, identity. How do you feel about that? Revealing your pub sorry, about revealing your public self, even in your private self through uh, digital platforms about maybe in Israel, I'm sure that the uh, identities of how you are in public versus in private. I mean, the way I experience Facebook is a kind of self-censorship more than anything else. I mean, if I get something from a right-wing politician, I would unfriend him. Uh, and regarding fake news and, uh, and reality, I think that uh, I, I agree with you totally. There was never a reason to trust the New York Times, for example. Uh, the only difference perhaps is in the reversal by which the person who's blaming people for being fake news is the president. I mean, that is new, I think, in that sense. So uh, the person who would have assumed the position we would think of as that of the skeptic, the artist, the transgressor is actually the president. That is, uh, that is the problematic that I see as, uh, again, that I was trying to, to refer to as someone who, I, I mean, I think art can and activists can engage different positions, but the position that I would like to engage, and like we spoke about forensic architecture, where there is actual knowledge being produced by simulation, et cetera, et cetera, evidence. And, but my position is more that of problematizing exactly our notions or presuppositions about what truth might be. And, and in that sense, how do you do it without being cynical? How do you sustain irony without being cynical? That is the... Uh, but, uh, but I like this idea very much because there is this, um, there is actually applications that would help you disguise your, say, your browsing habits uh, by instead of like blocking, blocking information, just like producing random information. So whatever, uh, whatever uh, data you're leaving out there is is going to be useless. So maybe, maybe there would be like an, a specific app that would turn all your uh, anti-CC or pro-CC. Uh, um, you know, photographs and messages into something else. That would be a lot of fun. <laughs> that would be a very interesting use of fake news. I think that's a really interesting example. I hadn't, I'm, I guess I'd heard that, but um, I, I've done something really similar. When I go to the West Bank, I fly through Israel, and in order to do that, I have a whole system of fake social, and I'm sure now I'm like, I've blown my, I've blown up my own spot, <laughs> but I have a, you know, fake email address, fake Facebook account, all of these things, because we know that Israeli officials look at that. And so do US officials, by the way. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've created a system where friends send me emails to my fake Gmail account, and they are saying other things than what I'm actually doing there. And so it's interesting because these are violations, at least the Facebook one is a violation of Facebook's rules. You can't have a fake Facebook account that violates their real name policy. 
And so I want to kind of try to just tie that back in real quick with something that you've been pointing to, which is like, why are we trusting these companies? Um, I think that we can use them. I'm using them in this case. I think that in, you know, a lot of these examples, we're utilizing them for our own purposes. But I think on the other hand, I'm, I'm really concerned that I'm seeing people that are, I otherwise ally with politically saying like, Facebook should do more, Twitter should do more. Um, do more what exactly? Because really the people who are most affected by censorship on these platforms are marginalized communities. That's been true since the beginning. And yes, we might want Facebook, we might want hate speech to go away, but I think we need to be talking about that in a different fashion. I would like to like take that outside of the company should do more about this box and talk about it from a more root perspective, from a societal perspective. How do we want to you know, bring education back on critical thinking and, and reading news the way that you grew up reading news? Um, how do we want to you know, teach people not to trust what they see on Fox News? Um, not, to trust what they, not to trust what they see in the New York Times for that matter, just because they're prestigious doesn't make them right. I think there's, a, there's interesting, this, this question of uh, identity and keeping like a fake identity all the time, not fake, because all of us, in the moment we, we are realizing that the, the Facebook, Twitter and, and all of those places, they're not places of like uh, where you can like express your emotions like freely or do whatever freely, because in the same time they are the places of control because they are used from like, for example, immigration services to check your account. So you're, then you're stuck into this kind of like uh, maintaining some kind of public profile that is correct, you know. And, and I, I think this is really dangerous for Facebook because in the moment when you're faking, like maintaining correct, faking uh, correct profile, you're not producing emotions anymore. And emotions are like one of the main resources for this uh, creation of profit. So like in, in the moment we are starting to like, you know, more Facebook is the place of control. It's more collapsing it into, into so the, it, the place for fantasy, for emotions will move somewhere else. And then somebody else will extract its resource and Facebook will become a new LinkedIn or Um, yeah. I, I wanted to respond very, very briefly to your point, uh, Jillian. Um, I think we, of course, um, we all would like to agree, agree that criticality is the answer. Um, but I also feel that what I've noticed in studying um, sort of new right, alt right uh, communities in, uh, and, and celebrities, in, uh, especially in YouTube, is that they are very devoted to a certain kind of, a type of critical thinking that is extremely uh, productive. And uh, that also for is uh, another characteristic of the affordances of, uh, of uh, 4chan, by the way, that it's very productive of conspiracy theories. Um, and so there is also a possibility that that can really turn into a, a sort of um, ur soup of bullshit as well. What a, what a fantastic conversation. Uh, I stayed an extra day here just basically for this, and I'm so glad I did. Um, I wanted to suggest that um, one of the questions I think that ties all of what you're discussing is what produces polarization? And originally, that was blamed, like after the US election, that was blamed on filter bubbles. And what I found interesting and so appreciated your opening comments is that it seemed there was a moment that the news um, was going to take some responsibility for that. And quickly, they started pointing the finger at these platforms and particularly at Facebook. And then also, I think the point that our own confirmation bias becomes um, what's pointed at, right? That, that we're causing the filter bubbles, but there's been so little discussion of whether the news has any role in producing that. So I think that's really spot on. And I noticed at the World Economic Forum that the two panels on this topic, the New York Times explicitly, um, all of the new, and the BBC, absolutely, they even refused to admit that they'd played the role that they did with regard to weapons of mass destruction, despite the fellow from Palestine, um, uh, bringing, from Pakistan, sorry, bringing up this, this question, but they, ref they rewrote the history of their own work in propaganda. So um, I just wanted to make that comment. 
And um, regarding the Facebook news feed policy change, it hasn't happened in the U.S. yet. They're experimenting with it in other countries. And the way that that's going to happen is no longer do you just flag a story. Instead, they defer it to other opinions, other reporting. And who's going to read that other reporting? And by the way, there's a new study that shows that the backlash effect of, of having the actual information correct it, making it worse, that it actually doesn't. So maybe there's good news in that. But but this um, the other way of, that, of bearing the news feed, um, that's disastrous for any kind of independent media, right? So this whole question of whether Facebook is a platform or a news regulator, it's huge. And I'm really curious if, so one of my questions is, do you have any other comments on the PR stunts that they are playing right now about, we want to make people happier by watching social media rather than being a news platform. That's their um, obvious, th that's what they're claiming. And this gets to the other point about critical thinking. The two talks I've given here have really emphasized that I'm concerned about this return of the New York Times and Washington Post, for example, saying um, uh, subscribe to rhetoric and that there's a return to this reason and critical thinking as the solution to this. And I'm, and I'm very interested in what you were saying about emotion being the concern. That's what I've been studying. And the emotions being targeted in this, I don't know if we have a form of literacy yet to address that. And I, I wonder if you have questions about that. And then the, f the question I had um, to you is you raised the question of the ethics of making this visible. And I'm really concerned about that because in the work that I'm doing, if I show how um, emotions are being targeted, and I've, I've had this concern when I'm showing how activists are using social media, how is that going to be used? And you ended up saying it's better that this be transparent and that we know about this, but I wondered if there are others who have thoughts about that. I, I think at the end, I think someone should have an, uh, should have an insight, and the question is who. And until which, maybe it's not like, you know, like we should have maybe like a commissioner for access to, I don't know, like this kind of algorithmic things. But the, uh, I'm, what I'm also really questioning is like our capacity to um, to keep up with with this. Because like the, the, the algorithms are changing so fast. Okay, they're developing so many of them. They're tuning them up and down. This is something that's like so, like it's not something that is fixed. And it will be like this as a rule for 10 days or one month. It's something that is changing on like daily basis. And uh, auditing this is probably completely not possible because like uh, we will need to have such a big bureaucracy to build like completely like new bureaucracy in order to do algorithmic transparency because like, and, and the problem is how we can compete with them. Like they are able to take the best data scientists, they're able to take like everyone who is like from after the school, after the university stuff, the best go to Facebook and Google. So we, even if, if, if there is like an idea how we can get there, it will be really hard from the point of like how we will really do algorithmic uh, uh, transparency. But I think it's important to be open for, as a concept <laughs> for someone, if someone like want to do research, that it's open. I don't know how we can do that. But again, it's not a technical problem. <laughs> it is a it is a different it is a commercial problem, really. No? Um, I mean, I personally think the only solution to fake news is, is proper news, <laughs> is that we do a better job uh, at you know at being journalists. Uh, and uh, and I don't know that this would create the perfect framework. I know this. Um, this this issue with the with the filter bubble is a problem. I think it's very funny that the New York Times, when they try to try to somehow uh, halfway um, introduce like a like a like a say antagonistic view uh, in their newspaper, um, it didn't work out so well. Um, shocking, um, but <laughs> when I read it, it was like oh, they picked like a neg like a climate change negationist. <laughs> like how can you start there? Um, at my newspaper, we do try um, 
more and more often to uh, to have different views on the same topic, uh, even though sometimes it makes us sick <laughs> to publish uh, some of those different views. Uh, we try to stick uh, to our ethical, uh, I don't know, um, <laughs> ratio of uh, of um, you know of what is proper to uh, to publish. But uh, we're publishing things that most of us at the newspaper do not agree with. Because I think that uh, the only way to deal with uh, with this filter bubble is really to to at least trace uh, you know the uh, the path to those that are voting differently and thinking differently and raising their children differently and and all that because otherwise um, you know we're heading towards a very difficult uh, situation to handle. Um, but I don't know uh, if we can resolve technically um, uh, what is not a technical problem. So my, my question pertains to what, what Vladan just said, because the, the interesting thing I find about algorithms is, no, is that they, they really, on a cognitive level, they bring out the worst in people. It is not. They just amplify our cognitive biases, heuristics, all the judgment errors, which are so inherent in human, in human the way we are structured, the way our brain, the way our brain works. So uh, it, it is really, uh, I think it is, in a sense, it is a technical problem. It, is, it, it cannot be solved on a technical level. It will have to be, I think, the, the proposal of, of an algorithmic uh, or algorithm transparency is really a, an incredible, uh, incredibly important step. And to be able to, to see how it works, because in the end, what really is going on, the, the filter bubbles, let's face it, they are not in the media. They are in the media or what we see on Facebook. It mimics what our brain, what, how our brains work. It amplifies them. It, in the end, it is a, a projection of our, our, our inner self. It is not something purely external. That's, that, that's, that is the interesting, one of the interesting aspects I, I, I find. So I was wondering what, aside from, do, do you think, does the panel think there is a, 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 a way to, to govern or, or to structure this on a political level, how algorithms can be structured, what they are, uh, whether they are uh, simply allowed to mimic or, or, or do in the terms of the information we perceive? Because we filter, not algorithms, we filter as well. It's not that just the algorithm. We are good people running around and, no, no, we need a lot of, the hi cultural history has been a very, long and strong battle to fight for an open discourse which did not biologically arise in us. This is really a cultural achievement and in, in a way algorithmic uh, structures is a regression into, in, into a pre-era uh, pre, uh, of, of, of or early era of, uh, of human culture. I agree, but uh, I mean, I think that you're right. We, we create our own bubbles, but it seems then that uh, the rhetoric you use for the algorithm is a little mythologizing. I mean, it's, n is, it's uh, business as usual, right? The algorithm doesn't do anything uh, that changes the fact that we always project and we have a, a level of self-forging, you know, a willful forging of what we see. Like what is terrorism, for example? Why would an Israeli act not be construed as terrorism or an American uh, military action? I, I also wanted to tell you that uh, I don't really see the need of a newspaper to accommodate a whole host of different opinions because it seems to me a little monomaniacal, assuming that you, know, that you have a reader that uh, this is the only uh, news venue that they use. We all know that there is 4chan and th there is Fox News. We all know that we can, the moment we feel more masochistic, we can go to the, you know, to the right wing uh, venue that would give us the, you know, the, the blows to our head that we need. So uh, I, I don't see that as creating, uh, you know, a more um, full uh, sense of uh, uh, what truth is. Uh. Yeah, but I, I do refuse to believe that half of my own country is insane. <laughs> I do want to understand the reasons to, I don't know, to voting, uh, who they vote, uh, even though it is clear to me that it goes 
uh, against their own interests? It's, uh, I, 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 it's, it's again open to interpretation. Uh, by, by your country, you mean Spain, not the U.S. No. Yeah, but I could mean the U.S. Like yeah, I is just the, read an is half by of the U.S. Quotes, really insane? Uh, speaking, I mean, <laughs> it used saying? to be uh, construed as a kind of a working class issue with uh, Trump. And I read a very compelling paper claiming to he's the first white president. I mean, because he won uh, throughout all demographic stratas, you know, among whites. Mm -hmm. uh, among working class uh, Hispanics and uh, African American, he lost. Mm -hmm. So I it is also a question of how do you bracket, you know, the, your position and choose to, yeah, to understand it. Uh, and in that sense, I think we're alone to, to be, to assume the responsibility as consumers, you know, uh, knowing full well that uh, emotion and uh, what we want to project is exactly what uh, Facebook is so good at uh, exploiting. Well, on that note, um, I think uh, we ran out of time. True. And uh, so if you want to have a, sorry. <laughs> yes. A last question, do we have time? Can we do that? Okay. <laughs> Bring it on. Um, thank you for, for your interventions. Um, the, the question I want to raise is uh, the one of authority. Uh, who is deciding uh, what to censor? Who is deciding what terrorism is? Who is deciding what's true or false is? Um, in France, recently, uh, Le Monde, uh, which is the reference, one of the reference uh, journals, um, tried to develop an um, a plugin for Firefox, so you could see when you read something where it comes from and what confidence you can have in it. The problem being the Monde deciding, uh, Le Monde deciding alone what was trustful and what was not. So for example, some some extreme left journals were, may, were, were written as not really uh, sure and very um, um, uh, oriented, but Le Monde has made the campaign for Macron from the beginning. And, um, and you, you, could, you could ask who's, who's and, and who's, why would be the Monde the reference and who's making the authority? And um, the crowdsourcing has also problem. I can't remember which which one of you spoke about uh, crowdsourcing the what is true and what's not. But um, I think uh, yeah, the, the the question of authority has been uh, among what everything you said. But I, we we need to find a way to reclaim the authority to decide collectively to decide what's true and 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 not. And yeah, I wonder if you had any comment on that, an idea how we could do that. Um, thank you. Come on. Uh, I would say that it should be the state. <laughs> no, 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 the state, the uh, sovereign nation states should determine, should be the uh, authoritative determiner, the decider, and not the corporations. Yeah, that we elect the the sovereign nation states that we elect. Yeah. And if you have some kind of like a way how to elect someone in like Facebook, for example, for Facebook we don't have an election, so like it's. But uh, but there is I mean there is you know there's uh, the ability to uh, one one can the the question of governance I, is always very uh, complicated and kind of a d different topic I guess in a way it's a little bit of a big scale thing, but it is a, an active issue in the European Union. They have, and they're very much on that. They're at the moment right now where they're about to, they're, they're, they're gathering their, their, all of their pieces together. And it's true. And in uh, maybe a month or so, they will, um, they will implement, they'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what they'll, do, what, what they'll do. But they know that this is the moment that they can do it. They're gonna have one chance. And so. I don't know, but I'm, I don't really get the question. I mean, on a, on a general level, we never can decide what's true or not. I mean, not as a collective, because there will be always kind of different opinions and different truths. I mean, individually, I mean, even for everyone. So, um, I mean, I kind of, I don't know, when I was studying, I did a lot of postmodernism and <laughs> and of course, on a strategic political level, there is, even then there is not, no truth, maybe a strategy and maybe a decision as a collective that we make, but I wouldn't call that truth, actually. That would be <laughs> scary. Yeah, 
So we have two minutes left? Not even? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's been amazing.